Hi, I'm Jeffrey Frank, uh, and this is History in Five, and I'm going to be talking about the relationship between Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th president, and Richard Nixon, the 37th president. Eisenhower and Nixon really couldn't have been less alike. Eisenhower had been the supreme commander of the Allied forces. He was 62 years old, probably the most popular man in the country, a national hero, the sort of we don't even have today. Nixon was a first-term senator from Yorba Linda, 39 years old. It's important to remember that Eisenhower didn't really even choose Nixon. Nixon was chosen by Eisenhower's advisors, but he had certain things going for him. He was a red hunter, which was a very big deal in those days, particularly the days of Senator McCarthy, and he was an internationalist. He supported the Marshall Plan. He was young and he was from California, so he was a perfect balance to the, to the ticket. In May of 1954, the Supreme Court handed down the Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka decision, which basically said black and white children are no longer required to go to separate schools. Eisenhower hated that decision. He thought it was disruptive of the society, and he really wished it hadn't happened. He also knew he had to enforce it. But privately, he said he could think of nothing worse. Nixon was pretty good on the issue. He said at one stop in, in Delaware during the 54 campaign, there are 600 million people in the world who are not white, and they're going to look to this country as an example uh, of equality of opportunity and of employment. And he said that his own children went to, went to integrated schools. As time went on and the 1957 Civil Rights Bill came along, Nixon had become pretty close to Martin Luther King Jr. They met in Ghana, and King was, uh, King was a fan of Nixon. That changed in 1960 when he ran for president and Dr. King was arrested on a trumped up charge. Nixon did not come to his, to his aid. He, uh, he, he said publicly, oh, this would be grandstanding. Privately, I think it was pretty clear that he didn't want to risk losing Southern, Southern white votes. And his old friend Jackie Robinson even turned on Nixon, called him a double dealer, a double crosser, a man with a convertible conscience. That was the end of Nixon and the, as, as a civil rights leader and the end of the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln. During the 1952 campaign, Eisenhower had promised, I shall go to Korea. And by that he meant he was going to, he was going to visit the war zone. The Korean War had already gone on for almost three years. 30,000 Americans had died. And in fact, Eisenhower did end the war. He ended it within six months of being inaugurated. And that was in fact the last war that happened under his, under his presidency. This all almost ended in 1954 when the French were being driven out of Indochina and Nixon the vice president, and John Foster Dulles, the secretary of state, wanted to intervene to help the French. And Eisenhower really managed to avoid any sort of involvement in that conflict. He was happy to help the, support the, the uh, Diem regime, the, the uh, South Vietnamese regime, but uh, he, uh, he did everything he could. He said, let's ask Congress, knowing Congress would never go along with the war. He said, let's talk to our allies, knowing that Winston Churchill had no desire to preserve the French colonial empire, having already seen the dismantlement of the English empire, and, uh, and he succeeded. There was no involvement in Southeast Asia, and there was no war. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite. Eisenhower saw it properly. It was not a great military threat. It was far more difficult to launch an inter intermediate-range ballistic missile to a precise target than to launch a satellite. And he knew the, the, the United States was also preparing to send a satellite up, too. Nixon, though, instantly saw this as a question of national prestige, as, as a great symbol of, 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 of national power. And he was very frustrated that, that America was taking so long, so long to launch its own satellite. Eisenhower joked about it, um, we don't have any enemies on the moon. Nixon didn't joke about it, and Nixon also saw how important it was to have a civilian space agency. Eisenhower said, oh, let the Defense Department run it. They actually are in charge of the hardware anyway. Nixon said, well, if we do that, the, the only incentive they're going to have will be to develop military uses of space. If we're going to have a peaceful exploration of space, we should have a civilian space agency. And you've got to give Nixon considerable credit for what became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The defining moment in the Nixon-Eisenhower relationship was the major heart attack that Eisenhower suffered in 1955. Suddenly, people were looking at Nixon as an heir to the presidency, and this wasn't done before. Vice presidents were not considered heirs to the presidency. What was really interesting was that Eisenhower also began to understand that no provisions had been made for succession. Not only were he to die, in which case Nixon would become president, but if he were incapacitated by a heart attack. And he, and he wrote out a very detailed memo for Nixon and for, the, and for the cabinet to follow in case something happened to him. 
He may not have loved Nixon, but, but he didn't want Nixon to be out of touch with the office. And so Nixon was someone, as Eisenhower said, prepared to step into the office if something ever happened to me.